there. Okay. All right, so here we go. So my name's Kenichi. I also work here at New Relic. I'm on the Ruby agent team. Um, but I heard, was it Dustin uh, talking about module prepend? Something we've dealt with uh, a lot lately because Rails 5. And um, we have this lovely blog post that my coworker Kewu wrote uh, back in December. It talks about all of the stuff that can go wrong when you mix alias method chaining with module prepend and super and things just get terrible quick. So uh, if you're interested, search module prepend on the New Relic blog and you will find it. Uh, but I'm actually here today to talk about uh, HTTP2. Have any of you used HTTP2? This one, two, half, two, three, okay. So I thought I would just read the uh, RFC to you all um, for a while, but it's a small talk, so we'll skip that. Uh, I'm not gonna go too far into details again. There are uh, articles on the New Relic blog that talk a lot about it. Uh, but basically, I just wanna start with what's really that different. Um, HTTP 1, make a connection, make a request, get a response, close the connection. Okay, sometimes you can keep alive that connection, but you still have to make a request and get a response, and then make another request and get another response. Okay, actually there's HTTP pipelining where you can make many requests in serial, or in series, and then get responses back in the same series. But you have to do it that way and you have to wait till they're all done. Now actually no major browsers currently support HTTP pipelining, so let's just forget what I just said, because it's useless. I know you told me not to do that, but I did it anyway. All right, so you make one connection, and then instead of requests and responses, you've got streams. And they sort of encapsulate this request response thing, except streams can be multiplexed. So as a client, I can make an HTTP2 connection to you. I can say, hey, give me a logo PNG and give me index HTML and give me uh, main CSS or something. And then as the server, I can start responding with whatever I've got ready for you first. And then interleave other responses in there as well. And the protocol is designed so that both sides can uh, demux de that stream, stream conglomerate and, and figure it all out. So this is gonna be really helpful for lots of things. Uh, mostly, uh, I'd like to point out one part about uh, inlining, concatenation, image sprites. This is all like what you'll see with asset pipelines. This was all to get around like that browser thing where they decided, okay, we'll make like six connections. And then, uh, you know, we'll try to do a bunch of stuff spread out over those connections. It's, it's a big mess. And if you've ever dealt with asset pipelines, you know how much of a problem that can be. Now, is HTTP2 going to solve that? In a lot of ways, yes, but there are some limitations. Uh, my coworker points out one here in that uh, if you are compressing with Zlib, compressing many little things can actually be less efficient than compressing one large thing. Of course, if you've got decent cache in front of that, well, that goes away. All right, so again, another blog post on the New Relic blog about it. And uh, this is a Ruby meetup, so I thought I'd talk about some Ruby. Uh, Ilya Grigorik works for Google, and he was on the spec committee for all this, and he's got a gem, HTTP2, that implements the whole protocol in Ruby. Uh, parts of it are binary, so it's not the fastest gem out there. Uh, to that end, uh, Aaron Patterson has DS9, which is a wrapper around a C++ library, ng HTTP2. Uh, a little bit harder to use because, uh, you know, it, it's very involved. You have to build everything up from scratch. Uh, so I decided to take Ilya's gem and take another web server I'm familiar with called Real, which is uh, built off the celluloid ecosystem. It runs in a celluloid I.O. reactor, which is very good at handling lots of long-lived, mostly idle connections, so web sockets, HTTP2, these are all gonna be good for real. Um, I've got a branch here, H2, that uh, gives server support for it. Um, in working on that, I came up with a client called H2. Um, this is still very experimental, very early stages, version 0.01. 0 
Uh, but if you feel like checking it out, please do. Um, there are other clients out there. I've been talking with this uh, lovely fellow in Milan, Italy. Um, he's got another client. We've been working together on some bugs in the original library. And then uh, I thought I'd show you just a little bit of how this could work in Ruby. If you're ever interested in making an HTTP2 server, um, you'll need a few things. So starting with uh, my branch of real, and the code's going to get a little deep here. If you can't see, let me know. Um, some basic setup stuff, our address and port, what we're going to listen on, a directory for SSL certs, because HTTP2 for browsers requires TLS. You, in a browser, you cannot use a plain text HTTP2 connection. It just won't happen. And the, as Rubyists, we're not really used to dealing with SSL, right? Like, we run our Rails app or whatever behind Nginx. That handles SSL, and, and we get proxied to, and we're all good. Well, in this world, we're going to have to deal with it. So um, I've got some Let's Encrypt certs here. And these are all on a valid domain. Um, I'm SSH to my Linode and piping stuff through so we can get there. Great. Uh, I just want to point out this bit here. This is a simple HTML, not even a head or body. Uh, but basically, you can see it's going to put the text, wait for it, try to load an image, and try to load some JavaScript. Um, never mind this stuff right here. But the real server starts off like this. We bind to the host, we bind to the port, we set up our SSL, and then for each connection, we deal with each stream independently. And it's going to look familiar to anyone with the uh, HTTP 1 uh, experience. You got a request, it's got a path, it's either get, post, whatever, all those things are still there. Um, in this case, we're checking if it's slash. We'll say we'll go away when you're done. We'll respond OK with that HTML up here. Uh, otherwise, we'll respond with 404. Um, I'm not too happy about these symbols, but this is how real works. I kind of like halt 404, like in Sinatra or something like that, but whatever. All right, so let's see how this works. Fire it up. And connect. And uh, you can't really see. But um, wait for it is there. There's a broken image because it didn't load. And you can see that logo PNG and pushed JS, all 404, and they, they tried. It didn't work. All right. So what's really cool about HTTP2 is you can do this thing called push promise. So I know with that index HTML, basically, that it's going to want a logo and some JavaScript. So I've got this set up over here for a stream push promise to go ahead and push that logo straight to the client without it even asking for it. All right, we'll save that. Restart the server. Ah, oh, live demo, it worked. You can see over here in Initiator, there's a push in the Chrome Dells. Actually, maybe you can't see it. I don't know if I can, yeah, Chrome DevTools don't zoom. Sorry about that. Uh, next thing is the JavaScript, but you can, you can see that the image did load here. There it is. Um, so we'll go back and we'll put in the JavaScript. Okay. Uh, this is simple. It's just a quick self-executing function to alert, hello, I'm from a push promise. Um, let's put that in. And there's a couple of different methods here for doing a push promise. This one, I just say push promise. Here's the path, here's the headers, here's the data. Go ahead and take care of that. Now, one of the neat things is the clients can say, oh, you sent me as push promise headers, uh, and I see the e tag is something I've already cached. Reset. I don't need that. I've got it. OK. So to support that sort of uh, deal, we've got this API for push promise for, and then it's the same thing, the path, the headers, and the body. And then instead, we take the promise and we say, OK, make that promise on this stream. Now, in between the time when it's made and the time when it's kept, the client can reset it and cancel it. In this case, uh, Chrome is set to disable cache, so it's just going to accept it. Hopefully, if everything works right, we will now on refresh. And there's the alert. So pretty cool. 
Uh, you could imagine a scenario where a server might have something like Nokogiri or some other HTML parser in it and just know what assets need to be pushed to the client. Uh, you can imagine things like pushing a server sent event JavaScript down and then uh, mimicking WebSockets with HTTP2. You can imagine all sorts of things. Um, and I invite you to look into it because it's the future. Thank you. Any questions? The, sorry, the image was loading. Right. If you look, the, uh, oops, the logo was first. I think it's just the browser executing the alert first. I think uh, that small bit of JS took a shorter time to get transmitted and parsed than the large bytes of the image. I'm guessing here. Yeah, that's it. Cool. All right. Thank you.